The Three Teachings. What are the forces that shaped Chinese society? How did China view itself and others in the ancient world? To better understand what you see in China, it's useful to know about the country's three historic schools of thought. Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. These three teachings are the bedrock of China's ancient culture and together explain much about what you'll see in that country. One way to remember the difference between these three teachings is that Confucianism is mainly concerned with political ideas and social harmony. Taoism is mainly concerned about the health of the human body. And Buddhism is primarily concerned about psychology and the nature of the mind. Although this oversimplifies these three philosophies, it does provide a good starting point. Each of these teachings also emphasized the opposite of its main focus. By this I mean that Confucianism promoted social harmony by teaching about self-cultivation. Taoism taught about health by emphasizing harmony with the natural environment. And Buddhism taught about mind by contrasting it with the material world of things and forms. Therefore, a complete picture of each teaching must include a balanced view of these opposite ideas. This view of life, where the play of opposites is fundamental, is symbolized by the Taiji, which we also call the yin-yang symbol. This symbol comes from China's Taoist religion, but is found in all traditional Chinese schools of thought. Another idea common to each of the three teachings was the concept of the Tao which means the way or path. Although the Tao is naturally associated with Taoism, the idea of living your life in accordance with a great natural way is common to all three teachings. Let's first take a look at Confucianism, which is based on the teachings of the social philosopher Confucius, who lived around 500 BC. Confucius lived in Shandong province, in a city now called Qifu. Today, many memorial halls and buildings mark the spot where Confucius lived. This place, called the Apricot Terrace, is where Confucius taught his disciples his philosophy. Behind it, a great hall with magnificent columns stands to commemorate him. Tradition says that when the emperor would come to pay respects to Confucius's memory, the columns would be covered so that the emperor would not see that they were superior to the ones at his own imperial palace. Inside the hall itself, the decor is fairly subdued. This accords with Confucian ideas of modesty and scholarly dignity and is repeated in Confucian temples throughout China. As we said, Confucianism was concerned with society and social relations. Thus, Confucius's idea of the way emphasized social harmony. He prescribed that everyone must assume their rightful place in society according to their ability. Confucianism recognized that ability cuts across social divisions and classes. This led to the development of an examination system where theoretically anyone with great ability could obtain a high position in government. These examinations were a regular event. Those who scored the highest were received by the emperor himself. Then, like now, some exam takers hired others to take the exam for them. This old drawing shows the punishment meted out to some of these cheaters. Confucianism relegated women to secondary status and was a feudal system but its emphasis on self-improvement and advancement through education and scholarship was, for its age, a progressive trend. Confucius emphasized hierarchy and rank, and this has had a great influence in East Asia down to modern times. One aspect of this outlook is that the elderly are highly respected due to their experience and wisdom. Confucius believed that the best way to teach was to provide a virtuous example for others to see and aspire to. 
This was especially true of the king. Confucius said a proper ruler was like the North Star, sitting in motionless virtue while others rotate around him in perfect order. The Chinese expression Wu Wei, which means non-action, expresses this idea. It is another idea found in all three of China's teachings and basic to traditional Chinese philosophy. When you visit the Forbidden City, you can see a sign that says Wu Wei over the throne in the palace building called the Hall of Union. Although Confucianism dominated traditional Chinese political thought, it was once seriously attacked. Qin Shi Huang, the emperor of the Qin dynasty, persecuted Confucianism. He burned all Confucian books. However, a few survived, hidden in this wall, at Confucius's old home in Qifu. The wall remains as a popular tourist site. Confucius's family cemetery, at least 2,500 years old, is in a green woods near his home. Hundreds of Confucius's family descendants are buried in this great green forest. The size and grandeur of this vast family cemetery exposes a tradition that still weighs heavily on China. Confucius's own grave sits amidst the greenery, a potent symbol of 2,500 years of Chinese political tradition now buried. While Confucianism emphasized education and social relationships, Taoism, China's main native religion, emphasized health and harmony with the environment. Only such a life, according to Taoists, can bring genuine happiness and longevity. The great way of nature, shown in Chinese shan shui or landscape paintings, is the natural course of life, and not living in harmony with nature was thought to be the cause of disease and misery. But while Taoism on one level was a nature-honoring philosophy, it was also a religion of many deities and supernatural beliefs. Taoists sought long life by eating and drinking special foods and potions. Taoist alchemists, searching for these tonics of immortality, sometimes made interesting and useful discoveries. Thus Taoism is closely connected with the development of traditional Chinese medicine. Lao Tzu, often regarded as the founder of Taoism, retired from the dusty world. He left his job and traveled west. Riding an ox, he crossed the country's border at a place called Hangu Pass. There, a border guard begged him to convey his wisdom before he departed. Tradition says Lao Tzu then wrote the Tao Te Ching, bequeathing it to the border guard and thus the world. The opening phrases of the Tao Te Ching are among the most quoted passages of Chinese philosophy. They say, the way that can be spoken of is not the timeless way. The names of what can be named are not the timeless name. For the way is the nameless origin of heaven and earth, and the mother of all things with names. Hangu Pass, where this was written, is a popular tourist site where old stone memorials, quiet halls, and lovely gardens commemorate Lao Tzu's meeting with the border guard. Taoism's pantheon is populated with a huge assortment of gods, from supreme deities such as the Jade Emperor and the Three Celestial Worthies, down to humble household gods that guard the hearth and the gate. Among them are gods for every type of activity and profession. The Eight Immortals are among the most famous figures of Taoist myth. They maintain their immortality by joining the three stars at a birthday party for another old Taoist deity known as the Queen Mother of the West. Taoist lore says that at this event, which occurs every 3,000 years, these happy spirits eat the golden peaches of immortality and perhaps a few of China's varied long-life mushrooms. Such mushrooms are a favorite delicacy of Taoist immortals. Here is a variety sold on the slopes of China's sacred Buddhist mountain, Mount Umei. Buddhism, the third of China's traditional teachings, is not native to China, but was imported from India, Buddha's home, about 2,000 years ago. Its influence in China is only slightly less than that of Taoism. 
Today in China, most temples you will see are Buddhist. The historical Buddha of India, named Shakyamuni, also lived around 500 B.C., about the same time as Confucius and Lao Tzu. His many teachings were written in scriptures that are called sutras. Some of these Buddhist sutras started arriving in China during the first century, coming overland along the Silk Road and arriving in Luoyang and other places. According to legend, a white horse carried these scriptures to China. A Han Dynasty emperor established the White Horse Temple near Luoyang, which is the place regarded as the starting point for Buddhism in China. The Buddha taught that life is characterized by suffering, which arises from people's greed, hatred, and delusions. The Buddha gained enlightenment, which can be thought to be an insight into the true nature of life and the mind. Buddhism teaches that this enlightenment liberated Buddha from the delusions and false beliefs that afflict mankind. Thus he sits in tranquil repose, unruffled by the chaotic world, the world the Chinese call the red dust. Like Taoism, Buddhism evolved from a system of rather simple and attractive understandings to be an elaborate religion of supernatural beliefs, deities, and practices. This was partly because Buddhism was everywhere mixed into local cultures and religions that had their own gods. This was true in China as well as in other Asian countries. Countering this trend, the Zen school of Buddhism developed in China around the 6th century. It based its teachings on certain sutras that emphasized that Buddha's enlightenment came from clearly understanding the true nature of the human mind. The founder of this Zen school in China is said to be an Indian Buddhist monk named Bodhidharma. He traveled from India to China by ship around 500 AD, arriving in what is now the city of Guangzhou. He is said to have built a hermitage at Hualin Temple, shown here. Nearby, his old well remains beside a market street. Bodhidharma's famous teaching was to point directly at the human mind, see its true nature, and instantly gain enlightenment and Buddhahood. An important aspect of Zen is meditation. For years following Bodhidharma, generations of Zen teachers spread throughout China and taught the teaching that mind is Buddha. A typical example of Zen teachings came from Master Huang Bo, who said, All the Buddhas and all beings are just one mind. There isn't anything else. This mind is beginningless and has never been subject to birth and death. It has no characteristics and has no shape or form. It is just what is always manifested. Just this mind is Buddha. Other types of Buddhism also developed and spread in China. Almost as prominent as Zen was the Pure Land School, a type of Buddhism that counsels its believers to attain salvation by chanting the name of Amida Buddha. According to this sect, Amida Buddha awaits his believers in a western paradise or western heaven where those who chant his name will be reborn after their death. Statues of Amida Buddha are often seen standing in this pose where he is shown greeting and welcoming his believers into his paradise. Another type of Buddhism known as Tantric or Esoteric Buddhism is the traditional religion of Tibet in Mongolia. Although Tibetan Buddhism includes a wide assortment of beliefs, gods and practices, its fundamental teachings remain the same as those of the historical Buddha and of Zen Buddhism. Paintings of Buddhist gods surrounded by their devotees come from this Tantric tradition. The legendary founder of Tibetan Buddhism, Padmasambhava, is a common figure in Chinese gift stores and markets. Looking at the three traditional teachings of China today, what can we see? Confucianism continues to influence the Chinese family system and, to some degree, the traditional Chinese respect for authority and the aged. Confucian temples have reopened in recent years following the tumult of the Cultural Revolution but are now dedicated mainly to a soft-spoken support of study and old scholarly traditions.
Taoism has also made a comeback. In Beijing and other cities, Taoist temples have reopened and are sites of Taoist worship. However, that religion has regained only a small part of its past prominence. Of the three teachings, Buddhism has experienced the biggest and most obvious resurgence. Up to 30 million Chinese now formally identify themselves as practicing Buddhists, and the number of persons who follow the religion in some less open way is much larger. Monasteries, where young men can live and practice traditional Buddhist lifestyles, are once again common in China. As Chinese society transforms its appearance into something ever more like those of Western countries, it is easy to forget the deep and ancient cultural currents below the surface of its modern cities and expanding economy. Like the West, China must find a proper balance between its new lifestyle and its traditional identity, one that honors its formative traditions but displays its new personality. In the future, China will grow not only as an economic power, but as a contributor to the world's cultural heritage. The three teachings of traditional China are a major part of this rich legacy.